Welcome to Close Cards from Texas. I'm Mike Vance. This week we'll meet a powerful Harris County leader. But first, you may not know that during World War II, there were more German POWs in Texas than any other state. The, the largest batch of German POWs that came to the state of Texas were captured in North Africa. And they were all part of uh, uh, General Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. Well, we were not captured, we surrendered. Uh, the, uh, the orders were from Hitler, we fight to the last men like Stalingrad, but we had wiser generals and they negotiated the surrender. So in many cases, the prisoners were captured by the British or by the French and handed over to the Americans because they had in, you know, 1943, no place to put them. Um, the rumors were that the, uh, the French would claim us to work in the mines in North Africa and I took a dim view of that. And I saw every day trucks came and they had red names and uh, they were going to the States. My body went that, let's go tomorrow. Well, we don't have anything. Well, let's try it. You know, we got on the truck. Uh, when they called a name, we say here. It was not our name. And um, we, we got onto a Liberty ship and uh, cruised for three weeks in a convoy from Oran through the Straits of Gibraltar to New York. They had to be housed in prisoner of war camps based on the conditions that they fought under. In other words, if you're fighting in the desert, you don't have heavy Arctic gear, so you wouldn't send them to like Michigan <laughs> or, or to Minnesota, especially during the winter, because they had no winter clothing. Those light conditions were found in Texas. In Texas, I believe there was about uh, 50 or 55 camps scattered around Texas. There were anywhere from, uh, there were all different sizes of, of camps. They put a few large camps, like at Hearn, Texas, and also Lufkin had a pretty large camp. The smaller camps were spread across rural Texas. Well, there was a severe shortage of labor, especially in agricultural areas. Rice farmers, uh, the timber owners, uh, some of the other uh, cotton crop uh, farmers and yeah, I think citrus farmers. Anyway, they actually paid Texas A&M through the uh, ag agents to hire these prisoners. But none of these camps, local camps, were more than 100 people at most. Like in Liberty, for instance, for the rice, the harvest for two years, they sent in 50 to 60 people. Sometimes it dropped down to 10, 15. Uh, now the camp in Hearn was very big and very modern. You'd think of it as a prison, uh, but most of the working camps were what they, what you would call them, working camps. Hearn had actively lobbied to get one of the big camps. Yeah, Camp Hearn was one of the first and largest POW camps to be established, uh, both in Texas and the United States. And, and uh, the whole project started right after the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. You know, Hearn decided that uh, they didn't have a large enough population to have a munitions plant or, or something like that, so they, they thought how they could contribute was perhaps getting a POW camp, and they lobbied their congressman, who then got the Army Corps to take a look, and they came down and said, yeah, this would be a great place for a camp. And the whole thing was constructed in, in a little less than a year, where they acquired the land, built the uh, barracks and the facilities, and uh, it was up and running by the summer of 1943, just in time to take those prisoners from North Africa. The POWs were moved in style. Here came the big surprise. Every prisoner that came to America had it. We walked to a train, Pullman train. I have never been on a train like that in Germany, always uh, boxcars, waiters, black waiters brought the food, and there was a MP on each end of the car. It was good. I mean, it was a big experience after the ship and all that, and we didn't know where we were going, but then when we came to Texarkana, my, my geography came away. I said, we just ended Texas, you know. Not all Americans found that acceptable. There was a, cafe, cafe, a restaurant in the railroad station. Served them all breakfast and told us to go in the kitchen to be served, which was bad enough, but there was no place to sit. All in there was potato sacks and, you know, boxes of vegetables and stuff. To, uh, there was, you know, you just got a plate in, in your hand and sat on a sack or something. And I got to tell you, that was, 
the second time in my life that I refused a meal when I was hungry, I didn't eat. I thought that was real hurtful that they would serve prisoners for war and would serve us. The prisoners were not disappointed with their new home. The Geneva Convention states that, you know, any, um, uh, any prisoner of war has to be housed in the same conditions uh, that you would house, you know, your own soldiers. So in other words, they had to live in the same kind of barracks and eat the same kind of food that the Americans were getting on the other side of the fence. They said they walked in and here were these wonderful wooden barracks that they were able to stay in. There were cots there with sheets and blankets on them. There was a shower with hot water and there was food constantly and always available. Some civilians called it the Fritz Fritz because, uh, uh, I don't know, supposedly we ate better than uh, the American population. Whether that's true, I would have no knowledge. The only complaint they had was about the heat. And, uh, you know, because there was no air conditioning at the time, so they said during the summertime it was just unbearably hot in the barracks. The camp was divided into well-guarded sections. Uh, if you entered it, essentially there would be the American compound, you know, on the, on the north side of the camp, and then the, and the camp headquarters was there. And then immediately to the south was a hospital area, you know, which would serve the needs of the uh, Americans that were there, as well as the German POWs. And in addition to that, then there were three separate POW compounds. All in all, the population at Hearn varied from about a high of about 4,500 prisoners to about a low of about 3,000 prisoners. A double fence around the compound, and each compound was separated by its own fence from the adjacent compound. Uh, there were guard towers you know, around the camp uh, with, with uh, machine guns up on the guard towers, and uh, there were patrols around the camp, both in vehicles and on foot. Those guards were needed since there was trouble within the camp. So initially when the camp opened, there was a huge struggle for power in, in the camp. And, and this was happening all over the United States at all these big camps. And it was mostly the, the anti-Nazi elements and the Nazi elements fighting each other. It all culminated in November of 1943. There had been a lot of riots and fighting going on. And there was a, a large, the, the anti-Nazis were going to attack one of the Nazi barracks. And, and uh, that happened, and a, a huge fight ensued. And at that point, then, then they separated the elements. And, and so what happened then is that unwittingly, that allowed the Nazi element to take control of the camp. You know, people got in trouble if they read the American newspapers and then told their comrades about it. You know, if they all sang a patriotic song and you didn't sing, then, you know, you might get beat up. Hugo Krauss was a New York resident who had returned to his native Germany, eventually ending up in the German army. He found himself in the middle of the camp struggle in December 1943. Is that, everyone, that immediately made him suspicious, you know, under suspicion. And, uh, you know, he was always going outside and talking to the Americans and talking, you know, across the fence. I was very outspoken against uh, Germany because he was sorry that he ever went over there, you know. What really did him in was when he went to the American authorities and told them where the secret shortwave radio was. And uh, so and he went out, told the American authorities, came back into the camp, and then shortly thereafter the Americans came in and just went straight to the location and yanked the radio out and took it out. And everybody knew who had turned it in. And a, a group of uh, German prisoners, there were about six or seven in the gang that got together, uh, one had a lead pipe uh, and, and the other ones had wooden boards and uh, they went into the barracks and he was sleeping in the top bunk and, and they just started pummeling this guy. One night we were all the bags as they'd stay in the bunk and they had masks on and they had boards with nails. They, they nearly killed him. He died three days later in the hospital anyway. Up next, daily life in Camp Hearn.